Well, a very warm welcome to everyone this morning. We are delighted to be able to host this curator in conversation here in the Bishop's Dining Room at Castle for a session especially dedicated to you students. Perhaps some of you joined the Castle lecture yesterday evening, either in person in the great hall or online, when we had the immense pleasure of hearing Dr. Barbara Bain introduce us to the world that Bishop Beck would have encountered when he traveled to the Holy Land, and especially the architecture and arts in general he would have seen. Thanks to this splendid lecture, we traveled from the Great Hall to Tunis, to Aqua, to Jerusalem, and were prompted to use our imagination to get a sense of the complexity and richness of these fascinating places of unforgettable cultural encounters, which, as you said, Barbara, are likely to affect us more deeply within our hearts than through objects that may be brought back with those who travel. It is in a way an intangible, immaterial, but nonetheless transforming encounter. It becomes part of you before you know it. But today, we have the honor and joy to have you for a little bit longer and ask you questions about what it is to be curator and the exciting questions, complex decisions, visits, negotiations, etc. that go on behind the scene in order to organize an exhibition, among many other things. Dr. Barbara Bain is the Paul and Jill Madoc Curator, Emerita of Met Posters. She has had a decades-long career at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, which is distinguished by creative exhibitions, form of collaborative work with colleagues from Toronto to Prague. Her latest co-curated exhibition with Melanie Hawkman was entitled Jerusalem 1400 Every People of Earth Heaven. Barbara is an alumna of Wells College. She also read history at the University of Aberdeen and earned her doctorate at the University of Fine Arts New York University. This morning she's in conversation with you all, but most especially with one of our very own students at Castle also in turn for our 950th anniversary year-long celebration of the castle, Catherine Bertram, a PhD student in classics and ancient history, researching Roman engineers. Catherine will be, speak will be asking questions and moderating the conversation as your questions come in as well. And I'll let her explain how this is going to work. <laughs> Again, none of this would have been possible without the whole team of the college, Porters, the catering staff, and particular thanks go, of course, to our principal, Wendy Powers, to our vice principal, Dr. Adam Crabtree, and our alumni and development manager, Julia Wong. This session is not live streamed, but it is recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, do please let us know and we'll make sure to edit the video accordingly. Also, may I please remind you to make sure to tick off your note of the list up there. For now, I'll leave you to uh, Catherine and Barbara, and again, a very warm welcome to everyone. Thanks. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I have a few questions to get us started, so we'll get talking and be inspired, start thinking about your questions, and then we'll open up the floor and see where we go get it. So I think probably a nice place to start is, what does a typical day in your life as a curator look like? Um, one of the wonderful things about being a curator is that there isn't necessarily such a thing as a typical day. The, um, it depends on what project you're working on. Um, it, it can be as dull as meetings, which I'm sure you're all very familiar, um, to as exciting as having an object walk into the building in the hands of someone uh, that you've never met before, which may or may not be proved to be something interesting. Uh, calls from colleagues and contact from colleagues around the world. Um, because I worked on um, medieval art um, while being in New York, I had a lot of contacts with colleagues um, here in, in Britain and on the continent. I would have said in Europe, but I should exit that. Literally, following up on it. Um, how do you select to get for any project? What is sort of the first step in developing an exhibition? I think that depends a lot on where you're working. Um, perhaps Gemma could disagree or agree with me, but 
sometimes it's a, it's something that just piques your curiosity. And uh, to me, that was one of the great luxuries of being a curator. I think that's true of being a professor as well, that, that, that the things that excite you intellectually, you, you just want others to know about them too. Um, sometimes they can be uh, imposed from the administration or from uh, other, suggested by other institutions. So it wasn't always, it didn't always have the luxury of it being my idea, but I often had the luxury of tagging on with somebody else's. Did you ever find yourself in a situation where you're struggling to come up with a new idea? Oh, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, it was more no, no. No, my only struggle is that now that I, I took early retirement, now that I've done that, I, I have all these ideas still bubbling in my head and nowhere to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now we know you have lots of ideas you've come this far. Um, what type of audience do your exhibitions tend to reach? And um, how do you communicate with the enthusiasm that you have with them? Right. So. You never really know who your audience is ahead of time. You might have a guess, right, that there's going to be certain strains of an audience, but you don't know fully enough. Uh, there's a story I, I often tell to students um, that helps me, that, that dates from my days at university, it helped me understand that I couldn't make assumptions about my audience. So I had a very close friend growing up who also went to Wellesley with me and we were both in Art 100, right, the introductory art history class. And um, she was raised with no religious background of any kind, not a very well educated person. Um, but when we got to doing Italian Renaissance and we were faced with religious subjects, she didn't know what they were. So she would call me on after a class and to go over her notes. And she'd say, well, okay, I, I, I made a little drawing. And there's a guy with wings on the left. And there's a woman on the right. She's sitting there. Now, what's that called? And I'd say, well, that's the Annunciation. How do you spell that? A-N-N-U. And what is that? Well, that's the moment <laughs> when the angel Gabriel comes to tell the Virgin Mary that she will be Mother of God, and I go, Mother of Jesus. Long pause. Do you mean to tell me that people actually believe that? <laughs> and you said, Yeah, billions of <laughs> century. Wow. Right? So here was somebody who grew up in my same town, but because she didn't have that particular aspect of her background, she was um, at sea when it came to trying to look at Christian iconography, right, and that subject. And I often felt that way in the Asian gallery. Like, wait, what's this story? I don't know this story. But that doesn't leave you out, because I believe that really great art can communicate across that gap, right? So a scene of an enunciation might represent the moment of, of surprise, or of awe, or of what's happening here, you know? Um, all kinds of subjects can reach you, even if it is not your particular cultural or historical or belief system that it represents. I can just go on a little bit more about that. Uh, I've, I've talked uh, a lot about scenes of, um, about the Pieta, right? So when I would take students around, and uh, I would say to them, okay, you are lecturing in the galleries or you're writing a label, how are you going to approach this subject to your public? Well, they would say, I would, you know, I would tell them about where this, is, this comes from the gospel. No, actually, it doesn't. Nowhere in the gospels does it ever say that Mary held the dead body of Jesus in her lap. It doesn't say it. Oh, well, then I guess I would try to explain to them that Brian and the priest were them. If you're not from a Christian background, is that part of the story that makes sense to you? Or is it that there's a young man lying dead in his mother's arms? That is an inversion of what's supposed to happen in the world, right? The mother's supposed to die first. The man is supposed to grow up and live his long life. 
But anybody who is a parent, anybody who understands, who has seen an untimely death, um, and especially what if it's a death that's been ordered by some kind of government entity, right? Which you might come to understand as you explore the story of the crucifixion. So that's the way, and, and gosh, you know, artists get that. We have one image of the Pietà, not as famous as Michelangelo's, but an exquisite one where Mary is holding her son's hand, holding like this, and you, you sense the weight of his arm, and it's as if the way she's holding this is if she's taking his pulse. It is the most poignant, tiny image. So when you think about your audience, you have to think about what what things will reach across the distances of their particular, a person's particular path. There's a longer answer than maybe one. No, it's great, especially thinking about this, what connections we can make to art. Taking a slightly different tack and something that I'm sure is on people's minds, how do you approach an object with difficult or controversial provenances in your job? Um, you know, there are all kinds of complicated provenances, right? Um, and so there's more than one mm -hmm. answer to that question. Um, Sometimes, of course, we have no idea where something came from. So let's start with that simple thing. Sometimes we have no idea where something mm -hmm. came from. An archaeologist who sees an object, uh, let's say this, let's say this is a lovely object, which is, but let's pretend that it is. Um, and there's something about the surface of this that tells me that it was once upon a time in the ground. And we can usually see that, right? Or it's been scrubbed so much that we know that it the fact that it was <laughs> somebody who didn't want it to be seen that it was once in Okay, so first we have the question of where did it come from, right. which we may never be able to establish. Um, and second of all, what, have we, what do we not know about it because we don't know where it came from? Right. Now, in the case of a ubiquitous object like a simple bottle, it may not with apologies to the archaeologists in this room, it may not tell us that much more, right? Uh, or it might. So that can be a question. Obviously, there are ethical and legal rules that govern what museums do in terms of acquisitions of archaeological material. Right. Um, and it, it sort of depends on when it came out of the ground. Mm -hmm. right? Anything that's recently come out of the ground that has no history, we, we wouldn't go near that. Right? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't go near that. Right? And you know, you all know that there are international regulations that govern this kind of thing, um, and that series music, that museums would of course abide by. There are other kinds of issues about Ognos having to do with what culture it came from and whether it left that culture. Uh, and came to another place in a way that uh, is something that is defensible, right? Mm -hmm. If somebody uh, buys something in, a, in, a, in an entirely legitimate way, that's not an issue. Um, if something is stolen, obviously that's out of the question. If something has been taken out of France to Switzerland and is then offered to me, no, I can't do that. Um, if uh, if something was confiscated at some point in history um, that we can recognize and that was a reprehensible circumstance, then that, of course, becomes an important question. So the classic one, and actually the one from which springs all, pretty much all modern discussions, is the Second World War, right? And if I may say so, um, American art historians really raised the level of awareness, took it upon um, themselves to convince the American government that this needed to be part of what the armed forces, the Allied armed forces did, right? We're not just going to actually um, recover France from the Nazis. We're going to make sure that Mont Saint-Michel isn't blown up on the way out, right? Or to the extent possible. So that was really a, 
you know, that overturned millennia of expectations about what happened, what, about what conquerors do. Uh, and the notion that it is part of your responsibility to make sure that cultural and artistic heritage is put back in place is a really remarkable thing. Um, and it, it underlies and underpins all kind of modern efforts to address those kinds of issues. Not always with complete agreement, right? The Nazi circumstances so egregious. How, how could they, if they think otherwise, right? So, um, yeah, that's a yeah, similar. Yes. Oh, sorry, Katie, do you mind if I? Not at all, please. Um, I was wondering, so just to jump to that. Okay. What about, I'm sorry, do you oh, mind? Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what about the objects that are of dubious provenance that are already in the museum? Have they, for example, done, especially the posters? ever consider restitution of some of the pieces in there? So, um, all of the pieces in the Cloisters collection, all the pieces in the Mets collection, when are, they are all here online, and everything that we know about the history of a piece is visible online. Um, there is nothing in our collection at this moment that I know of that is not properly in our hands. If there were, I would be, um, it would be incumbent upon me to address it with the legal department at the museum. And sometimes it is it's not impossible that someone else outside could see something in this listing and realize that there could be a problem, in which case we would hear from them. Now there are international standards by which museums abide and we abide by those standards, right? So if something was acquired in 1880 in Florence, let's say, I mean, we have some, ah, perfect example, we have some manuscript cuttings uh, that were acquired in the 1880s that are Italian. I know that some American bought them in Florence at that time. I also know, historically, that those choir books were taken out of the monasteries because the monasteries were secularized under Napoleon and people were selling off pages from the very, from the Napoleonic, beginning in the Napoleonic era. That's also true of the many uh, museums in Britain, for example. Uh, Fitzwilliam has a lot of such uh, cuttings, so does the DNA. Um, those no longer have a function where they were. We don't know exactly who broke up the books or who sold them. Um, those institutions don't even exist anymore. So what do you do? They are legally the property of the museums that hold them today. Do you, do you see the difference now? Yes, yeah, so we're just thinking, for example, about the paintings of San Valerio de Blanca, which are- I'm sorry, the paintings of? Uh, so it's a church in Spain. The paintings belong to the Metropolitan Museum and are more yes. the Prado. And the yes. paintings left in Spain in um, kind of not completely legal circumstances in the 20th century and the, that kind of thing. So right. And it's a very interesting study case. Right. So you actually may be aware that the you know there was a lot of uh, not thesis, uh during Spanish Civil War um, that actually is happening in Spain and under then legal circumstances. The pieces that are with us now are part of a, um, a fairly complicated uh, accord with Spain, so there is no um, disagreement with the Spanish on that subject. Um, so that, that's actually a, um, a good example of the way that things uh, that are historically messy can nonetheless that you can reach an accord with a um, with a cultural uh, body. Usually, there's a minister of culture writing these um, going forward. Right? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Excellent. So this is a really fascinating world that you're letting us in on, and maybe if despite all the entry, we're still keen to take up a role, a job. In the museum field, any advice that people must do? Do I have advice? Oh, so so much advice. <laughs> um, my first bit of advice, which is always my first bit of advice to students, is everyone that you see in this room, you will see or hear from again and again throughout your career. So be kind, be kind, be generous, be supportive of one another. 
um, because it's the right thing to do, and because if you don't, that somebody else is going to remember how you behave towards them. Um, so much of, I suppose this must be true in other domains, but I don't know anything about other domains. <laughs> I don't really know about these things. So much of what succeeds, succeeds because of rapport that is established and trust that is established between professionals. The other advice that I historically give, uh, maybe is arguably less good, less important advice than once upon a time, but I still believe in it. Um, know at least some, know as much as you can of other languages and other cultures. It, again, it's about establishing um, a bond of trust with your colleagues in other countries. They all speak exquisite English now, right? When I, when I first started working and I would go to Spain on business, I didn't speak Spanish and they didn't speak English and we would speak French together. And that was the same thing, same thing in Poland. So we had a language that we could find between us. That's pretty much not the case anymore. Everybody speaks exquisite English. And probably better English than I could ever hope to speak another language. But um, but it's it's a it's a bridge. It's a it's a really important bridge. And sometimes other things will happen that you'll actually understand some subtlety because you'll hear a colleague say something even when you're not in direct dialogue that lets you see that uh, you have work to do to have them understand why your project is important or some of the subtleties of what you're looking at. So I guess those are the two big. Do you have any questions from here? Um, how close is in the average, um, like you mentioned that there isn't really an average day, but in the working relationship between conservator and curator, how close is the connection and relationship between individuals on that level and how do they interact with each other, especially like in that? Right, that's a really um, wonderful question. and. The answer at the Met is probably different from the answer in a number of other places. And you know, I had the great luxury of having a team of conservators in all domains, <clears throat> experts in all domains. So we have a textile conservation department, a paper conservation department, uh, a paintings conservation department, an objects conservation department, and then uh, there are conservation, you know, there's a spe special photography conservation department, which doesn't apply to me, but. You, you, you take my point. And there are, there are experts in each of those domains of the Met. Most museums don't have that um, bandwidth, I guess is what you would say to me, right? And some institutions don't have conservators on staff at all, so it's, all, it's a question of an outside contractor. The French museums, for example, they may work repeatedly with the same textile conservator, but they're usually not on staff. They're they're contractors. It doesn't make them less good conservators, but it, the facility of dialogue that conservators and curators have together at the Met is, uh, is a, an amazing thing. And so in my particular um, career, there were a number of projects that I did where a conservation aspect was absolutely integral to the uh, project as I designed it, right? And so I had very close collaborations. Yes? Hi. Hi. Uh, so usually, uh, so there only strikes me like exhibitions that you have pieces from all kinds of... Places. I'm sorry, so, I can't hear you. Uh, something that strikes me like exhibitions is usually have play, uh, pieces from all types of institutions, private collectors. So it was only if you give us some insight on how you put all these people together and convince them to loan the piece to you. For example, how you know that they have it. 
Ah, the so students. your so your interest is specifically in private collections or both private and public collections? How do you find the pieces that you're going to use? I suppose private collections are a bit more complicated, I suppose. So um, more <laughs> right. Uh, are they more complicated? Not necessarily at all. <laughs> um, so I mean, it depends on the project. Um, most projects you start from a kind of core of objects that you're aware of because they've been published in, you know, maybe they were exhibited 40 years ago or something like that, right? Which probably seems like an eternity to you. Um, and then you, then you have to start digging and talking to people and that's a really fun part of the research. Uh, you know, you, you, you begin to know which journals, things that are related to the work that you do might be published in or you look back at one sale catalog and then you find another thing that was there that you know hasn't been mentioned but it was there too and then there's a mention of that collector so it's you know it's a it's a network thing um, and i guess you're interested in how we go about negotiating those um, and that's a that's a wonderful wonderful experience uh, and very very deeply satisfying for the curator and uh, when the piece comes and you have it on loan, it, you know, there have been times. Uh, let me see if I can reconstruct this. When I did the Jerusalem exhibition for one case, for those of you who were last night, I was going on about these Damascus basins, these big, beautiful Islamic metal pieces. And we had a big, splash of them in one of the final galleries um, in the Jerusalem exhibition. And the lenders were from Doha. Uh, London. And the Israel Museum. No, maybe it wasn't the Israel Museum, it might have been a different museum, but in, in Israel. And one other. So, the installation of that case, you know, you're going to have an object that's that important, the owner is often there to supervise, right, so that they make sure that you're doing it properly, that your case conditions are what they should be, and so on. So they're all standing there, right? So I have a woman from Doha, and I have a woman from Israel. People whose governments won't even speak, and they're there together, brought together by these works of art. Can I tell you, everybody was on the verge of tears, because it was such a powerful moment about art as a language where cultures can meet and have the same kind of goals. It was, it was exquisite. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really fascinating to think about it. I just follow up a little bit, sort of practically, technically, you end up like writing letters to people and so you usually already know them before you get into contact. Is it cold calling? I'm cold. Never cold calling. Never, never, never cold calling. Um, so, it depends on what rapport you already have with the lending institution. So if I want to borrow something from Boston, I will email or pick up the phone mm -hmm. and say, I'm doing this project, can we talk about it? They already know when I call them or email them, but probably I want to so like, I need them, they'll need me at another moment. It's that part of it's easy. Except when you get into this sort of tricky bits of conservation, which point you were going to want to go see them, talk to them. Usually I would try and look at the, if the object is on show, I'll try to look at it first before the concert, the conversation so that I don't go in ignorant of what the issues around condition might be. You, you want to know as much as you can so you don't seem, especially in the case of a uh, big institution, a big prominent institution like the Met, you don't want to look like Daddy's calling up and you better do what I say, right? You can't be like that. You have to 
um, you have to uh, uh, approach these things on showing the respect that you should already have for both the object that you want to borrow and, and your colleagues there. If you don't have that respect, you shouldn't be in the project, right? But, but to demonstrate it, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that. That's the easy stuff. That's your institutions you already know. Um, lots of times, because of the nature of my work, um, I would be borrowing from churches. Um, and so I would, um, I would either write ahead of time directly, or I would speak to someone. So, for like, uh, for example, to be introduced to the Franciscans in Jerusalem, you know, like through the grace of God, I had a friend who was a Franciscan in New York who had been in graduate school uh, at the same time I was, because he had a collection at the uh, Friary that he was uh, affiliated with. So. You know, I went to him for advice first, and he then contacted somebody, contacted somebody, and you know, the next thing I knew, I had a meeting in Jerusalem with the appropriate people, and then we had an, any number of meetings to to get to know the Franciscans, and the, one of them was going to be one of them wanted to tune in last night, but he registered, he tried to register too late for the lecture. <laughs> okay, watch it out. So it, these are people that I still have, you know, I mean, it was only 2016, but we are regular contact. Just keep coming back to the importance of connections. Yes, yeah, very important. Any other questions? Obviously, objects have biographies and narratives, and it's quite a personal question, really. Um, obviously, there's the obvious ones, what it's made from, how it's made, who it belongs to, but obviously, there's these other hidden narratives. Obviously, throughout your career, what has been the most poignant or most interesting object you've curated, and why did you have that connection, do you think, to that object? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, we actually talked about this on my list. Day, <laughs> sure. um, first of all, there are, uh, there are a number of answers I could give you. But let me, um, there are two different ones I could give you. Uh, let's start with National. Absolutely. There we go. Um, so, this is uh, a story that starts at the very beginning of my career and goes straight through to today. So, on the left hand side is a head of King David from. Uh, Notre Dame, which entered the Metz collection in the 1930s, having previously been in several 19th century French collections. And on the right, do, do, does that, has anybody seen these objects? Anybody know what they are? So this is an amazing story. In the 1970s, I don't know the exact date, I don't want to say it's 1977 ish. Um, they were digging in Paris at a place called the I don't know, it was a bank. Uh, bank something, ah, Bank National de Commerce Exterior. And they were digging, I think, to put in an air conditioning system for the bank. And as I dug to do that, lo and behold, these guys were underground. And they were all facing, lying with their heads, facing towards, in the general direction of Notre Dame. Well, in, during the French Revolution, the more radical elements of the revolutionaries uh, came to the mistaken conclusion that the kings whose images appeared on the facade of the cathedral were in fact the kings of France, and we know what we were doing to the kings of, uh, and kings of France at that moment. We were cutting off their heads. And so a government order went out, and all of the heads of the kings on the facade of Notre Dame were decapitated. You won't see that today because they've been replaced by Ville de Duc in the 19th century. But the originals were chopped down and set in a big pile in front of Notre Dame, just left there. And masons and stuff could come along and you know take bits and pieces for, I don't know, house repairs or whatever. But some soul, we don't know who, carefully gathered up, and I don't remember the total number of heads, and carted them off and gave them decent burial, where they stayed until the 1970s, when by chance 
thanks to air conditioning, heating, whatever it was, they were unearthed. So, um, someone in the French cultural ministry contacted the Met, wouldn't we like to exhibit these recent finds? And our then director, Philippe de Montebello, said, yes, thank you very much, we would. And so they came to be installed in the medieval galleries. Um, I had just started working there, and I was working as a secretary there. I had not started graduate school yet. And they were escorted to New York by a brand new curator at the Cluny Museum in Paris, Museum Cluny, which you probably know. And she was a, a, what the French call a stagiaire. She was an intern. She was the one who was assigned to escort these things and stay with them in New York for quite a long period of time. As it happened, I was the only person in my department who had conversational French, right? Everybody else could read French, but they didn't speak it. And my young colleague didn't speak a lot of English at that time. So we were A, the same age, and B, I was the person who could speak French for her with her. And we became friends during this project. I can't remember what the original question was. The question was about stories, right? So these pieces were put together because the head that's in the Met had suffered the same thing, had been cut off. They were put together for the exhibition because they represented um, you know, this great find and the, consequen the consequences of extreme radicalism, right? Um, and so the pieces were together. These are now in the Musée de Cluny. Um, they were, uh, which you can't see right now, but it's reopening this spring. Um, and so, but the other story there is that she and I um, are, are still friends today. She was with me in New York the day that I went to labor with my second son. Um, <laughs> I've been to her children's weddings, her grandchildren's baptisms. We, we've been friends uh, since the 1970s. That's not really about the story of the object. It's about a story about an object resonating for me as a curator. And we were talking about this the other day. You know, um, we have an uncanny, curators have an uncanny and almost inexplicable relationship to collections. It's, you, you get a sort of sense of, um, a kind of a sense of mission about what you do. Hi, um, just yeah, thank you for this talk, it's been so insightful. I, I was actually I'm possibly the only person here who is in, in uh, art history, so I'm an engineer actually. Um, but I'm interested in history of art as a kind of passion and side interest. So it's, uh, yeah, for me, I always think about when you talk about private collections earlier, how you have to kind of negotiate for, say, an exhibition. Um, how do you feel about private collections and how important do you feel is um, public access to art? So we're very blessed in the UK to have government funding for our galleries and we can walk into the National Gallery, which I love very much, for free. And, um, how important do you think that access is for the public to gain an interest in understanding and care for these right. pieces? Um, there will always be collectors, right? You know, when I collect champagne corks, <laughs> every bottle of champagne I've ever enjoyed, I have the cork. Um, there's an, I think it's a, a human instinct. Somebody someday may decide that those are great works of art and that I should, I don't know, donate them to a public institution. I may or may not choose to do that. But my collectors, historically, and it, it's just a human instinct, I think, uh, have played a huge role, actually, in preserving works of art, often works of art that were not considered um, such by uh, by the general public. You know, often they're in the vanguard of uh, identifying. You know, is photography an art? Is the print medium an art? Um, does art from uh, cultures that are not Western it, is it as important as as something? that came from medieval France. Um, collectors have often been, been ahead of the public and ahead of scholarship uh, in uh, acknowledging that. Another thing about collectors is most of them want to show <laughs> what they've got, right? So uh, historically, you will find that private collectors are quite willing to um, land and to share. Sometimes that's because they're wanting to monetize their collections. Um, and I don't borrow from a private collector, I didn't, um, unless I, 
unless I had uh, often, it's sometimes it's a, it's a question of how well you know the person, but there have been circumstances where I actually had an agreement in writing that such and such, if it's going to be lent to us, will not appear on the market <clears throat> for X number of years after it has left from that, right? So there's that aspect too. You don't, you don't want to be, as a curator, you don't want to be um, the person who's setting the market. I'm not a curator of contemporary art. It's a lot easier for me to say that than I think it is probably for some of my colleagues who do who study. Um, so most collectors want to have their pieces known. They're proud of them. Um, should public access be imposed on them? No, I don't think that's, I couldn't get behind that myself. Um, eventually, most things end up in public institutions. Right? And places like Britain and France have laws that make it attractive for collectors to ultimately to allow things to come into public institutions. Yeah. 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 Building of the Met Cloisters itself mm. because I had a Google and you had a Google yeah I had a Google of it and <laughs> I, I was, it's a stunning building it looks very Venetian in design and I just wondered is, is that deliberate and what is it like to work in a in a building that is sort of built in the middle of um, gosh I think it was Venetian oh, I made that mistake sorry <laughs> um, well let me let me answer your question. <clears throat> I, uh, huh. it's probably hard for the people in this room to wrap their heads around this. But when the Cloisters was built, very few Americans could travel to Europe. And if Americans were to know anything about European medieval civilization, um, there had to be a different way for them to come to that understanding. And that underlies the genesis of the cloisters. Now, um, the cloisters, well, there was, a, there was a guy called George Gray Barnard, who was an American sculptor, uh, who had the advantage of uh, going to study, I think, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And he became uh, infatuated with French medieval sculpture. And uh, he started buying it up from places like barnyards in the south of France. Or um, bath, there's a bathhouse, okay, there's a bathhouse somewhere. He ran in some, I can't remember which city. Um, but it was this kind of architectural material was not um, protected at that juncture. So he bought it legally, and he sent it back to the U.S. And <clears throat> he had his own private <coughs> cloister for a time. And then his own finances took a turn for the worse, and he decided to sell it, right? So the Met bought the lion's share, not all of it, but um, the best. <laughs> Sorry to you. <laughs> the Met bought the best of the things from his collection through funding provided by John D. Rockefeller Jr. And then there was this, an effort to determine who was going to come up with the design, because it was decided that you couldn't just keep Barnard's cloister or whatever, where you could be taken around by people in monks' costumes. Um, and that there needed to be a new building. And so then there was a uh, competition for who would be the architect, and ultimately it was Charles Collins who had built Riverside Church in New York, which was another Rockefeller project. And the idea was to balance, interestingly enough for this audience, to balance the notion of church and castle. Um, and so there are aspects of the Cloisters building that feel like castle, and there are aspects that feel like church. And probably more church than castle, but there are certain aspects that connect. What surprised me, so 
The purchase was made in 1925. The building was begun in 1933, and it opened in May of 1938. And I went to look at, at one point when I was giving the lecture about this, what was said what, you know, in the speeches when it opened. It's in May of 1938. And I'm thinking, this is all going to be about like European civilization is at risk, you know, things are terrible, things are happening over there. Not one word, not a hint, not even the vaguest notion that Europe is about to erupt in complete, and, and, and it's already, I mean, Hitler had been in power since 1933. How is it that they aren't talking about this? Not a word, not one, I was so shocked. And do you know what Rockefeller talked about? He talked about providing for the profitable use of leisure for the working classes. Why? Because just around that time, Congress had decided that, you know what, you cannot make people work seven days a week for interminable hours. There have to be regulations. And what were they worried about? They were worried that if the working class had too much spare time, they would just drink themselves into oblivion. And they better give them something better to do on a Sunday afternoon, so maybe you could visit a place like now, I'm, I'm making, I'm exaggerating this slightly, but that's what all the tone was about in the, in the speeches. The, the profit, the word phrase that was used was the profitable use of leisure. Um, so, yeah, an educational component, but really about well, let's get these people some culture. Did that answer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think it has to be one more question. Well, actually, two, but I say the last one for me. <laughs> So my interest, because I'll show this, so my interest is in destruction of religious images, particularly in second century English Civil War. The way that you mentioned the Civil War was not that it's just like that effect. And I totally agree that this is a sin. I have a question on behalf of me and some of my archaeology friends who are studying for archaeology, particularly in post medieval. Is there any advice or tips that you can so if someone who wants to go down the museum route, what would you particularly look for on the receiving? Oh, what would I look for? <laughs> the first thing I'm going to say to you is, I don't have the luxury of looking for anyone anymore, right? Because <laughs> I took this retirement. Um, and I'm not sure that the answer to that question would be the same this year as it might have been three years ago, four years ago. Um, so that caveat to start with. Um, the things I look for actually don't show very well on anybody's CV. Um, passion and commitment. And <laughs> sounds so silly, but a love of works of art that is just irrepressible. Like it, to me, it's almost like a calling, what we do. Um, we were talking about this the other day, but where does the word curator come from? Well, there's also the word curate, right? Do you know what a curate is? A curate is a position in a church, right? A curate takes care of parishioners. A curator takes care of inanimate objects, which are, by the way, are much easier to take care of than <laughs> human beings, right? Um, but there, I, I look for that. I look, I look for, the, for that. And that's usually something that you can <clears throat> only perceive after you've gotten past the CV and the, and the beautifully crafted letter. <laughs> well, I think we're coming quickly to the end and I have one more question, which is sort of off the agenda, but I want to talk about it. What's your favorite artifact or object that you've done in your career? Um, there are times that you could ask me that and you get a different response. Um, but we did talk about this the other day, and so um, I, I talked to you about um, what I'm going to share with you now. So I had about a, a year before my retirement where I spent trying to be very deliberate about spending time with my younger colleagues and talking to them about uh, things that I thought mattered. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I had a significant reunion uh, for Wellesley College, and so I decided to actually talk to, about my, to my fellow alumna um, about how I had gotten set on this trail, and, and I could do it through this single, single work of art. So. <laughs>
Um, some of you will probably know this work of art already. That when I, how much time have I got? Two minutes. Oh, five minutes. When I was in college, this was in Art 100. You know those glasses, right? There's a guy kneeling at the left, and there was a woman on the right. I remember we talked about that. And this work of art was introduced to us <clears throat> as something very important. And from the point of view, really all they talked about was the formal analysis in those days. <coughs> and whether, and the historical connections, right? Was Jean Pucelle, as this Parisian artist, influenced by Italy, which clearly was the case. But what interested me about this is this little figure right here, kneeling, who was the figure of the queen, right? The queen who commissioned the manuscript. And as someone who went to a women's college and who graduated, the year I graduated, the, the women who received the honorary degree that year were quite remarkable, whatever. Uh, so, for example, Barbara Jordan, who was one of the first American women congressmen, received an honorary degree that year. Um, Golda Meir was there to receive an honorary degree. And my name starts with B, so I was seated, you know, up, up close to the front. And I was really struck by these um, women who, whether you agree with their politics or you don't, were really transformational in their, in their societies. And I was thinking about this queen of the 14th century. Who was she and what she, was she about? And it was particularly poignant for me at that moment because soon after I graduated, well, all the time that uh, I had been in college, the American <clears throat> society had been deciding on the issue of whether equal rights for women should be part of the United States Constitution. And you may or may not be aware, but it is not. It had to be ratified by a certain number of states, I can't remember what the number is, within a certain deadline, or the whole thing would disappear, and it has never been ratified. It is actually still being discussed today, the deadline passed in the 1970s, <clears throat> still being discussed today about whether they can override the deadline, because now there are enough states, but it's too late. Right? So, I was in this strange position as a young woman starting out in my career of having gone to a women's college, knowing what women were capable of achieving, and yet being told by my very own government that, you know, really, you, you, you're not, right? So this work of art spoke to me already at that time because of that. Some years later, not very many years later, the AIDS crisis broke out around the world. It had a huge impact on the art world. Uh, there were people that I commuted to work with on the subway who succumbed to AIDS, who worked with me at the museum. So this manuscript came back to me again because this, was the, this is the image of St. Louis feeding a leper, right? So the idea that a saintly act was for someone who was king, right, to go and have the courage to feed a leper and not be afraid. And meanwhile, by the way, this was the time when the Princess of Wales was doing exactly that in this country. So this manuscript, again, was something that uh, was resonant for me. I then worked on this manuscript for um, uh, an exhibition project, actually, met just one of the students last night, one actually, one of the professors here had seen this exhibition when she was young. Um, I became particularly affected by the image of the flight to Egypt because as I looked at it, I don't know if you can see that the background isn't just a design. There are creepy little characters in the background. Have you ever read Where the Wild Things Are? Well, there's, there's almost a Where the Wild Things Are aspect to the background, and I realized they were like bats and creepy things, and the, and the sky, you know, the field was a blue, and I thought, hang on, I think they're trying to show me that this is happening at night. And I went back to the Gospel text, and I had never noticed before that it says that Joseph took his wife and child and left from Egypt by night. And so, oh my gosh, the art taught me that. I had heard that gospel before. I never, never processed it. And then this scene, which is actually about the status of 
you know, people who are obliged to leave their homeland because they're not safe. And of course, this is something that's very much in the news, right? And so the image of the flight into Egypt from this manuscript um, became very poignant to me. The cloisters is not very far, it's about a quarter of a mile away from, maybe half, half a mile, I don't know, from um, an Episcopal church, so and part of the Anglican Communion, that um, offered sanctuary to uh, a woman and her from Guatemala, who was about to be deported during the Trump administration um, with her children. And so that woman and her children have been living in this um, Church of the Holy Cross, I think it is, um, right near the cloisters. And we one day walked, we, we sell stuffed unicorns <laughs> in the shop of the cloisters, and we, uh, we got stuffed unicorns for those kids and took them down to that church. So again, it was the same same manuscript that had an impact on me. Um, and then more recently, uh, again, some of you doing what one should do. Here, you, here somebody is um, in a hospital, taking care of the sick in the hospital. And what I loved in this particular image, if you see the way that <clears throat> the king's own robes flow into the bed covers of the, of the sick man, um, so that there's this, uh, sense of the care, the intensity of caregiving. And this image um, was really resonating with me during the pandemic when, you know, both here and around the world and in New York um, has affected me. People that I know who are in the health industry, you know, who are daily risking their own lives to care for people who are suffering from the pandemic. So in terms of a work of art that has been a favorite of mine throughout my very long career. Um, this would be it. Well, I hope you all join me in thanking um, Dr. Green very much. It's a really fascinating talk. Thank you so much.